a crew member? Uh, no, but I've been here for seven years now as a volunteer, restoring the boat. Yeah, there's doing a, a good job, it's nice. Yeah, there's a young lady that works here, and it's me and her doing all the work. Uh, we've rebuilt the stern, the bow, they were gone. Uh, and uh, so we've learned, I've learned the complete history of it. We've got the machinery history records, we've got all the engine logs. We got invoices for food during the war. Really? Uh, a lot of information. Wow, that's interesting. We could probably do something with that. Yeah, it, uh, yeah I'd love to get, help you with any information you want. But right, yeah. We're trying to get the word out on the boat. Uh, this was the first of this class completed before the war started. Mm -hmm. So it served through the whole war. And this boat had a lot of the first things that submarines got, like air conditioning mm -hmm. and a lot of other stuff. This uh, what looks like a toilet bowl float is actually one of six of the level gauges. It's an electronic uh, uh, metering and as the float goes up it tells you how much uh, fuel is in the tank. And there's six of them scattered so the whole tank's covered. But this was a fuel expansion tank. So it wasn't always full, and uh, the level would vary as you, know, you used up the fuel. I saw you welding earlier. What, can you explain real briefly what you're doing to yeah. help Tom? Down there welding on the framing. We're going to have to replace a lot of the framing. This is uh, one of the fuel ballast tanks. Normally it uh, has fuel in it. There's flood ports in the bottom to allow the seawater to come in and use up the fuel so it's always full. You know, maybe full, half full of water and half full of fuel. But that way if you're depth charged it won't comply to the tank. It's a double hull. What you see here is the pressure hull. That's the, what we call the people tank. Then the outer skin uh, for the fuel tank. The pressure hull is 9 sixteenths of an inch thick. The fuel tank skins only a quarter to three eighths. This rod here and leverage comes down and operates a flood port in the bottom. So they could close it off. But after the first 10 or 12 of the Gale class was completed, they quit putting the, the flood port covers on and just left them open. So this is a really rare uh, boat to still have these. Uh, even if, during the war, uh, they cut some of them out because uh, they weren't really needed anymore. So these were usually left open. And we're in here now, we're having to replace the framing, uh, we're going to sandblast and paint uh, and replace any of the deteriorated metal. This part of the deck here the originally was teak wood. Teak was used because it didn't float, it was lightweight, and when it was damaged, uh, it wouldn't float to the surface and give away the position. It was also easy to repair. It's been replaced with steel channel. The after part of the deck is still the original deck. The drum was first commanded. It had a three inch gun on the after mount. There's two mounts and the skipper could have the gun whenever he wanted. It started out with a three inch gun. In 1943, they took it off and put a four inch gun forward. And then in 45 in the shipyard, they took the four inch gun off, put a five inch gun on, and it was back out. This was an ammo chute they put in in 45 to pass the five inch shells up for the gun. These cans here held shells for the five inch gun. Uh, as ready, ready ammo, it held about seven, I think. So when they surfaced, they could open that and start shooting right away. These held ammo for the smaller guns. The top can up above actually had a machine gun in it. And there's another one in the deck, uh, on the uh, cigarette deck there. Up above, on the aft end of the radar, you have a lookout station, and then on the forward periscope, you have two lookout stations, one on either side. When you surfaced, you had three lookouts at the top. You had two guys on the bridge. It allow a few guys at a time to come up and come onto the deck here. They called it the cigarette deck. 
They smoked inside, but uh, they allowed to come out and get some fresh air. Most of the guys didn't want to come topside because they were afraid to get left up here. You didn't have the rails on board uh, during the war years either. It was all open deck. So it was pretty amazing. Unbelievably, there's only two people restoring this project. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your service? Well, I spent 10 years in the Navy. Now I was on two nuclear submarines. One, the first one was the USS James Madison uh, missile submarine. The second one was a fast attack, the USS Seahorse. Uh, I did a total of eight patrols, all of them north of the Arctic Circle on the Atlantic side. Um, chilly. Yeah, it was uh, 38 degrees inside the boat. Uh, we had the opposite problem uh, from these old days. This is the ship's office. This is where the Elman did all the ship's paperwork. Christmas tree. It's your whole opening indication panel. It tells you the position of your hatches, air valves, valve tank vents. You want all green lights before you submerge. It means everything is closed. You won't get water in the people's tank. Underneath the deck here is your uh, pump room. You have two high pressure air compressors, the hydraulic system, air conditioning, refrigeration compressors. Driven rain. I noticed looking through this book, the sub was in pretty bad shape when you first started it. Yeah, uh, the park got the boat in 1969 and it was on display behind the pavilion in the water for 30 years. It never got a hold of the painted, so it rusted away. They took it out of the water 12 years ago and uh, they didn't have the money or the manpower to do anything. So finally they said, okay, it's your boat, keep me informed. And uh, we sat there, we didn't really know how we were going to do it, we didn't have any money. So we started raising money for it, mainly from donations from submarine veterans, and getting uh, the steel donated from the steel company and other companies donating things. And we just dug in and started. Uh, we decided that uh, we had to, to do something. To this is the conning tower of the submarine. This is the control center for their attacks on shipping. This, uh, there'd be eight to 12 people in here during battle stations. You had a helm uh, at the forward end to control the direction of the boat. You had sonar over here, radar back here. You had a navigation chart table here. And then on this side over here, you have the torpedo data computer. These are the torpedo firing panels. This is where you fired the torpedoes from. Now, at the start of the war, the conning tower had a door, watertight door, in the back of the uh, cylinder here, so the gun crews could go out through there. On the eighth patrol, a depth charge cracked the door frame and flooded the conning tower. They went back to Pearl Harbor, they tried to repair it, they couldn't, so they had to go to San Francisco and get a new conning tower put in. This one is, came off the next class of boat, so the conning tower can go 100 feet deeper than the rest of the boat. It's got a little bit thicker skin. 
So the crew up here felt a lot safer until they realized they were still attached to the boat. The last one they dropped put a 16-inch crack in our conning tower. If they would have dropped another one on us, even close, it would have took the conning tower right off the... and would have sunk right How much there. do you think needs to be done to finish the restoration? What stages are there? We've got three or four more years, maybe, maybe more. Uh, we were just in the tank yesterday and I knocked some rust off of some of the framing and it's even worse than I thought, which we've found every time we get in one. Yeah, as we go, we find out yeah. how so, bad it really is. This is the helm. Up here is the hatch that goes to the bridge. That's the one you see uh, when they come down when they dive and water comes in. There'd be five people on the deck, our top side, you had three lookouts, two guys on the bridge. Last man down will close the hatch, and there was only, you only had 30 seconds to get in and close that hatch before water started coming in. There'd be somebody standing here to grab the guys when they dropped in, throw them over to this ladder so they can get out and clear this one, and you just keep it up, and then there'd be somebody down at the bottom and piling them down there. And you just dropped in the hole, you didn't hit the ladder at all. Bounce off the first couple of stairs and then slide down with your feet on the side of the rails. And you're looking through the book, I know a lot of people probably don't realize um, how rough the things really were, what kind of conditions they are, I mean, especially that radio. So you have a picture of when you hauled it out, yeah. and then a picture after you got done painting it. Yeah. It's really amazing. Yeah. Leslie said in the radio shack, and scraped and cleaned that up and painted it uh, in there. And, uh, you saw it, saw it, there's not enough room to move. And uh, she does fantastic work restoring this stuff. There was a torpedo loading hatch up here. They cut that out to put the ladder in for the visitors. The hatch was set at an angle. You'd pull the skids over to line up with the hatch, pick this end up with a chain fall, and the crane would put the torpedo on the skid and slide it down. And then they'd lower it down and then push it into place. And then pull it down and up and do the same thing. My husband was on the USS uh, Coops, the guided missile frigate, oh. in the Vietnam War. Oh, yeah. Wow. And they, they did the, the uh, guided missiles on a, a just a, like it was on one Sunday, or I don't know, one day during the week yeah. for just us uh, wives and everything. It was. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, unbelievable. Yeah. Really something. But what, what I was how did how did you get resupplied with torpedoes once they used them? Well, they had to go back to a port where they had to go back to a port. Okay. okay. Yeah. And uh, the boat made four patrols out of Pearl Harbor. Then they moved to Australia for four patrols, and then they moved to other islands as we took them over from Japan. And they moved a sub tender in. Wow. Uh, so they didn't have so far to go to Japan mainly. But, uh, yeah, this boat, uh, the first patrol in uh, May of 1942, was to the mouth of the Tokyo Bay, mm -hmm. and uh, we were. This was the first submarine to go there. Wow! And the first ship that spotted they sank it. It was a 9,000-ton seaplane tender. At the time, that's what they thought it was. We found out three years ago from new records that it was had been converted to carry many submarines. Had ten mini submarines on board. Oh my God! It was leaving Tokyo to join up with the task force for the invasion of Midway. If the drum hadn't gotten that ship, the whole battle of Midway. This is Ford Battery, also known as Officers' Country. You have the officers' wardroom, officers' stateroom, battery compartment underneath the deck. We just had curtains on the doorways. We had a two-man stateroom there, another two-man here. And then in here was the three-man stateroom for the junior officers. They had them across from the captain so, so that they would kind of stay in line and uh, not create trouble. And then here we got our junior captain. You okay? Yeah. <laughs> this is the captain's cabin. This was the fourth skipper of the boat. He was the youngest submarine skipper during the war. He was only 26. 
He made 11 of the 13 patrols. So tell me about your website. Well, <coughs> the website came about uh, about seven years ago. There was a young man that came on board. His uncle served on the submarine World War II. He'd never seen a submarine. So I gave him a super tour through it, told him all about submarines, what they did, and everything during the war. When he got done, he said, I'd like to help you. He said, I don't have any money. I don't have the time to come down here and help you. Can I do a website for you? So he started it. And then we feed him the information. But he's hand typed the whole patrol reports into the website. That's 195 pages. And he's done a lot of research on his own. And he posts all of our restoration uh, pictures on it too. And, and the website's just been fantastic. www.drum. 228.org. Check it out. Okay, this is the, the officer's wardroom. This is where the officers ate, played games, planned war, and uh, uh, hung out. Uh, the officers ate the same food as the crew, but they got the fancy silverware. Battle stations, you closed off every compartment. You closed the bulkheads off and everything so that each compartment was a compartment by itself. And so you have an address on the website for donations also? Yes, uh, the, all donations come directly to the submarine veterans uh, chapter here in Mobile, and uh, they're handling the restoration fund for me. And of course, I'm the uh, commander of the base, uh, so. Basically, uh, have control over their money too, uh, and uh, uh, all the money we get is used strictly for the drum, nothing else. Right. This is the chief's quarters. Five chiefs. They were the senior enlisted men. They all shared that. This is the control room. This is where they controlled the ship when it was submerged. This is the electrical panel. Didn't have the plexiglass cover on here normally. That's your 120 volt AC panel, open switches. It's kind of fun walking through here while you're taking rolls. This is your gyro uh, control panel here. And over here you have your helm. The helm for, and down here was the secondary helm. Normally operated the helm from up in the conning tower. Uh, they're connected together. Let's talk about your book. Okay. Uh, First off, where can I get a copy of this? Okay, so it's the gift uh, shop. You can get it in the gift shop, uh, and uh, in the gift shop they're signed. Uh, each West, copy is signed in. Yeah, each copy is signed by Wesley and gift shop in Mobile, uh, Alabama. Yeah, okay. if you don't want it uh, signed, you can get it on Amazon.com. Amazon.com. Okay. Yeah. Great. I just completed it two months or two weeks ago, uh, and the reason I wrote it is we've been uh, in a couple other books. One, a great one, uh, that is about all the museum books. That was the first one. But it's just a, a brief description of the boat and what it did. Uh, then uh, another author came a couple years ago and spent two days. And uh, we okay. thought he was going to do us a really good book. But it turned out uh, he did it about the drum, the silver sides, which is a museum boat in Michigan. And I got tank. convoluted on you there. Yeah, well, he lost in put the in the tank, too. And the tanks already had five books written on it. So we got about 25 pages on the drum, 35 on the silver side. And I said, well, if I'm going to get the story of the drum out, I'm going to have to do it myself. And it really is a story that needs to be told because this shit has done some amazing things and was really there at the beginning yeah. of World War II, yeah. almost immediately after Pearl Harbor. And this was the, right to work. This was the first new submarine into the war. Uh, and it was a very successful one. Place eighth for Tony Sunker. And two shallow water gauges. They have bigger increments so that you can have finer depth control when you're at periscope depth. A lot of times the skipper would ask for six more inches of scope out of the water or a couple inches less so it wouldn't be spotted. 
Back in the corner, we have the trim and drain manifold uh, to pump water to and from the trim tanks. And, and behind them is one of the radars. So how long would it take me to the drugs place? Well, the drum uh, was used after the war as a reserve training boat until 1967. After that, uh, they called down here, they already had the battleship, and asked for if they wanted the submarine. They said, sure, we'll take it. So they brought it down here in 69. It sat on display behind the pavilion in the water for 30 years. It rushed it away. They uh, decided they had to get it out of the water to save it from the hurricanes. They dug a trench where it's sitting now, floated it in here, built a coffer dam around it, back filled with dirt to raise it up, drain the water out, let it sit on the dirt, and then pour, dug and poured the piers. And then uh, Wesley and I started rebuilding. When did you start rebuilding it? Uh, seven years ago. Seven uh, years ago. Which was uh, about 2006. And here is the radio room. This radio here is their entertainment radio. The, uh, this is what they use to listen to Tokyo Rose. And we have reports in the patrol report that at one time they could pick up San Francisco radio when they were off the coast of Japan. Okay. This radio is the radio transmitter. Uh, it's, your cell phone's got more power than this. But this is what they had to use to communicate with headquarters. We found half of this, the 600 pound half in their uh, free refrigerator, got it out, it was all corroded. Wesley sat in here, cleaned it up and painted it. The other half we found in after battery, it was even worse, and uh, she cleaned it up. There you have your telegraph key for uh, sending your Morse code. That's how they normally sent and received their messages. The first thing you saw was smoke on the horizon. Then you tracked them, and if they come close, why, well, uh, took a shot. This is the ice cream machine. They drug out their ice cream machine in 1942. That was the most important piece of equipment besides the coffee pot. Inside here is the galley. They cook four meals a day for 72 people. They had three cooks, the night cook was the baker, did all their breads and pastries. This is the cruise mess, there was four tables in here. They could feed 24 people at a time, which was a whole watch section. The ongoing watch would eat first, then the off-going watch. Underneath here is the refrigerator and freezer. Normally it had a solid hatch on there, but we put that in so you could see it. To make life interesting for the cooks, Underneath this hatch is where they stored the ammunition for the deck guns. So the cook had to control his oven temperature a little bit. Huh. This is your main induction valve. Now you've got two of them here that lets air into the boat uh, for your diesel engines when you're on the surface. You had to run the diesel generators when you're on the surface. The yellow, yellow handle valves are the hydraulic valves for your ballast tank vents. They were operated by hydraulics, but if the hydraulics failed, you could open them manually. Um, how did it come to pass that you started this project? Well, I started coming over here in 2000, uh, before they took it out of the water. It was the first time I saw the boat. I hadn't thought of submarines in 30 years. So when I came on board, the smell brought back all the memories. I met Leslie. Uh, she's been here as an employee for uh, almost 16 years now on the drum. And uh, uh, she showed me through the boat and everything, told me what she was doing. And I got interested in helping. My job would bring me through here every few months for a couple of years. And I'd bring supplies and tools uh, to give Leslie so she'd have work easier. And then uh, my job changed again, and I was coming through here every other week and stop on Mondays, spend a couple of hours, bring Leslie supplies, tools, then I'd arrange it where I could be here all day Friday. And, help her. It's a small and then I took her away, uh, a week's vacation, help her get boat ready for the crew reunion, which was every June, and I'd stay for the reunion and get to meet a lot of the crew, and that got me more interested. 
And then during this time, I got the patrol reports, found out what the history of the boat was and how historic it is. It's the oldest U.S. submarine left in the world now. When was this uh, boat put into action? It was commissioned the 1st of November, 1941. It was the first of the Gato class. So right after Pearl Harbor. They got Pearl Harbor on the 1st of April, uh, 1942. And went on the 1st of April. Made 13 patrols, sank 15 ships, damaged 12 others. Placed 8th Battalion Sun. Very historic ship. So I decided I had to do what I could. This is Cruz Burley area. And underneath the deck is after battery. We had another battery compartment down here. 36 bunks in here for the crew. This is their personnel lockers to keep your uh, personal stuff. Mainly you put your cigarettes in there and the one bar of soap they got for the war. They couldn't take showers at sea because they couldn't make enough water. So they get condensation off the ball and wipe down with that. This is the original air conditioning. This was the, actually the first production boat to have air conditioning. Kept it a pleasant 90, 95 degrees. Then they had to shut it off to be quiet and conserve power, which about every time they submerged, they get up to 120. So they just wore shorts and sandals. Uh, and everything in here was always damp. And there were 78 bunks for crew 72, except for the last five patrols they carried up to 83 men. So uh, the junior men had to share bunks. When you get up and go on watch, somebody else would get in the bunk and sleep. And here's the crew's head. There was two toilets for the crew. They had solid doors on here, so you had a little bit of privacy. On the opposite side, there's the shower and the washroom. There's a wash machine in there. That's brand new. They didn't get it until June the 45. This is the forward engine room. You have two diesel generators to uh, produce power to recharge the batteries and to run the motors that drive the ship when it's on the surface. There's an auxiliary generator underneath the deck here, so it's really crowded down there. And again, these had, you had to be on the surface to run these. When these were running, they'd be fairly cool because of the airflow. When you submerge and shut them off, the temperature would get up to 140. They may only be submerged for an hour before they pop back up, start them up again. They might be on the surface an hour, submerge, do that four or five times a day. Uh, and so it never really cooled off in here. Outboard the engines is where they stored their coffee, flour, in 20 pound square tin cans. There's a platform and you had to crawl outboard around the aft end of the engine to get to it. In the corner back here, are the distilling units to make fresh water out of seawater. They didn't work real good in the South Pacific because of the warm water. They normally didn't work real good anyhow. But if you ever got into cold water, they did a lot better job. That's one reason they couldn't take showers, they couldn't make enough water because these weren't working good in the South Pacific. This is the after engine room. We have one of them cut open so you can see the inside. These are kind of unique engines. They have two crankshafts, one on top and one on the bottom. They're called a posed piston because you have two pistons coming together in the same cylinder uh, for your compression chamber. The top pistons are intake valves, the bottom piston is the exhaust valve, which makes these very reliable. These were the best engines they had, and they're still making them today exactly the same. They're using them for emergency generators on the nuclear submarine. Almost everything in the engine room is still made today by the same people, still being used. It was really good equipment and amazingly high tech for the 1940s. This is your main electrical control room. Inside the cubicle here are your breakers for your batteries and diesel generators. The levers here open and close the breakers. The outboard levers 
control the motors ahead or astern. The outboard wheels control the voltage of the, or the speed of the motors. This is your propeller RPM and the speed of the ship. The metal wheels control the voltage of the generators. These control the speed of the generators. This is also the machine shop. Over here you have a ways to make repair parts. The drum's kind of unique too. Uh, above the cubicle on all the boats, there's a plate that's riveted on so they can pull the whole cubicle out in case they had to service the motors underneath the deck. On their test dive, in new construction to test depth, that plate leaked, shorted out everything. They lost all propulsion, all lighting. They got to the surface. The war had just started. They didn't have time to drill out all the rivets. So they uh, built a drip tray with drain lines to the bilge and set them to war. It leaked through the whole This war. is the after torpedo room. As I said before, you've got four torpedo tubes back here carrying six reloads. You had 14 bunks. This is the way the bunks were arranged in the forward room also. These torpedoes are Mark 27 torpedo. They're electric homing torpedoes. They came out in 1944. Drum carrying on the last patrol. Ship, you were pursued. I can't remember a time that we fired at something and the escorts didn't come at us. They sounded just like a freight train coming over. You could hear them coming. You know, they were going at high speed and really revving it up. The thing here is a flare gun. You shoot a uh, signal ejector. You shoot flares with it. Uh, you use flares on uh, training exercises mainly. Uh, when you're working with another ship, you'd fire a flare, let them know you're coming to the surface. You'd fire a flare, let them know you shot a torpedo and sunk them, and uh, various other flares. Also, if you sink, you can shoot a flare and they can find you. With a torpedo, these skids are on rollers, and then lock them, pull them over, lock it in place. Uh, and then you open the inner door, push the torpedo inside. Then you close the door, flood the tube, equalize with sea pressure. When you fire the torpedo, air pressure comes in through the valve on the side to push the torpedo out. Normally you can't open the outer door with the inner door open because you flood the boat. Uh, Leslie and I overrode the interlock so we could open the outer door to store our t tools in it when we're rebuilding the stern. We're the only submarine museum that can do this. <laughs> I can see the water. <laughs> yeah. Oh, air! See. <laughs> the escorts were turning toward us or had sighted our periscope. So he immediately would take her down. My job changed and I was coming here every other week. Uh, I stopped on Monday, spent a couple of hours, bring Leslie some paint, supplies, tools, and I'd rain it where I could be here all day Friday. And I would take a week's vacation so I could be here for the crew reunion and I got to know the crew. Then we forgot the patrol reports I found out how historic this boat was, and so I had to do something to help us. In uh, 2007 or 6, uh, my wife passed away, so I moved over here and retired and came on board as a volunteer to restore the boat, and I've been here ever since. So, how does this uh, restoration fund it? Uh, the, we're getting our money uh, mainly from subvet donations. I'm the one raising the money. Uh, the sub vets are starting to run when they see me coming because they know I'm going to be out there the wall. Uh, we get some donations from the visitors. I've got a steel company donating all the steel to us. Uh, uh, Stanley Tools donated uh, a bunch of tools to us. Other companies have donated the use of uh, equipment and supply. Uh, and then we just recently got permission from the Navy to sell the lead ballast. And that's given us a lot of money. To sell the lead ballast. Yeah. So uh, is that just a high scrap value? Yeah, well, yeah, fairly high, but we had 116 tons of lead. 
So is it, I probably heard something about the lead from that time is different from the lead now. Is it work more? Is that true? Yeah, no, it's the same. It's the uh, same. Yes, yeah, although this was pure lead. Today they got a lot of impurities. Mm -hmm. But this was uh, pure lead. They were very happy to get it. And uh, the lead, uh, staff people actually uh, gave us two people to help get it out of the tanks. The lead was in 50 and 100 pound bricks. Uh, so we had a lot of fun they just it. like crawl down in there and set them in place? Yeah, we had to go inside, cut the straps off that was holding it in place. I hung an electric winch on the inside of the tank and I made ice tongs to grab the lead with mm -hmm. and would drag it up to the hole and then drop it out the hole and put it on the pallet. Wow. 116 tons. Uh, 116 tons of ballast yeah. was in this yeah. boat. Yeah. Oh, do you know what the weight of this boat was originally? Yeah, uh, uh, displacement on the surface was 1,500 tons. 1,500 tons? Yeah, yeah submerged 2,000 tons. During the war, uh, a lot of the submarines would lose a crew member in the war storm the side, uh, shot by aircraft or uh, surface ships. Drum is one of the few submarines that never lost a crew member. We couldn't get scared or anything like that. We had to have a clear head. We all had a certain duty to do when we would get depth charts. And we had to be perfectly quiet. We would go quiet. Everything would go quiet. They would shut everything down. Make the least noise as possible. And, uh, and then listen for that destroyer coming. We got caught in the middle. They were crisscrossing back and forth, dropping depth charges. If they were close enough, you could hear them click. If you could hear the click, that was the arming. Then you pulled your phones off. Then, then you knew that it was going off. The lights some, uh, would blow, uh, like a light blow out and, and, and stuff and make you feel and you're wondering, oh my God, are we going to survive it or not? If they kept you down, say, 18 to 20 hours, you didn't have any air to breathe. And you didn't have any battery left, so you pretty well had to get up. The periscope went up to sea and done a quick turn around to see if there was any, any ships in the area so we can get up the top side and let that water out and get back to, to home. But we just steamed in and tied up. I can't recall anybody coming down to welcome us. Didn't care. We just uh, was anxious to get there. I was happy and to be home and the war was over with and I pray to God that it never happened.